The 2016 Japanese kaiju film, Shin Godzilla, marked a significant addition to the Godzilla franchise. Directed by Hideaki Anno and Shinji Haguchi, with a screenplay by Anno and visual effects by Haguchi, the film is produced by Toho Pictures and Cine Bazaar. Distributed by Toho, it's the 31st installment in the Godzilla series, the 29th produced by Toho, and represents Toho's third reboot of the franchise. It also has the distinction of being the first film in the franchise's Reiwa series. Starring Hiroki Hasegawa, Yutaka Takanuchi, and Satomi Ishihara, it revolves around government officials grappling with chaos descending upon the country following the emergence of a colossal monster dubbed Godzilla. In this iteration, Shin Godzilla retains its iconic portrayal as a massive prehistoric reptilian kaiju. However, this version stands apart due to its extraordinarily advanced physiology. This is attributed to Godzilla possessing a significant leap in genetic complexity. Originally a member of an unspecified prehistoric sea creature species, closely related to marine reptiles from the Paleozoic era, this genetic richness is key to explaining Godzilla's evolutionary trajectory. Over time, the monster undergoes a number of transformations, progressively adopting a more reptilian appearance through multiple distinct forms to adapt to its new environment and threats, each of which will be explored throughout the video. The film opens in Tokyo Bay, where the Japanese Coast Guard boards an abandoned small boat. Inside, they find it pristine, except for the mysterious absence of the scientist who is its sole occupant, with only his shoes left behind. As they investigate further, the boat is suddenly rocked by a violent exterior explosion. At the same time, a deluge of material resembling blood floods an underwater tunnel, causing widespread alarm and damage. As people evacuate the area in panic, the Japanese government scrambles to understand the cause of these bizarre incidents, initially believing it to be some sort of volcanic eruption. The events capture the attention of Japan's Deputy Chief Cabinet Secretary, Rando Yaguchi, who, after watching a viral video showcasing a massive entity in the bay, becomes convinced that a living creature is behind the destruction. Although his theory is initially met with skepticism, it gains credibility when news reports begin showing a massive tail emerging from the ocean. <laughs> In a surprising turn of events, as the Prime Minister is publicly asserting the improbability of the creature reaching land, it does exactly that. The monster, a bizarre amalgamation resembling both a moray eel and a frilled shark with spiny dorsal plates and rudimentary forelimbs, makes a dramatic appearance. Struggling to adapt to the terrestrial environment, it bleeds from its gills and laboriously drags itself through the streets of Kamata in Tokyo. Unfortunately, its movements are found to be extremely destructive, pushing aside ships and cars and crushing infrastructure as it climbed over buildings, leaving behind a huge amount of devastation. Amidst the chaos, government officials continue their urgent meetings, attempting to respond through bureaucratic means that don't seem to keep up with the pace of the rampage. In response to the unprecedented threat, the government focuses on military strategy and civilian safety measures, with Yaguchi appointed to lead a task force dedicated to researching the creature and high radiation levels detected around it, leading to the theory that it's powered by nuclear fission, much to everyone's shock. <laughs> Things intensify when the creature, having wreaked havoc on the streets, halts and collapses. This marks the beginning of a shocking transformation. Its skin, initially a rubbery yellow, begins to ripple and harden into a scaly, burnt orange exterior. The creature's intelligence, while not as overt as other versions, is subtly demonstrated through the way it can develop new features and abilities. The adaptations are specifically tailored to overcome various challenges, showcasing a form of strategic thinking, like the development of the more durable hide as Godzilla transitions from its aquatic origins to better suit a terrestrial environment. The evolution also appears to be a preemptive measure to withstand assaults from the Japan Self-Defense Forces, suggesting an anticipation of increased resistance following its initial foray onto land. The creature's gills also shrink and close, while the stumpy protrusions on its sides develop into tiny clawed arms. Its hind limbs, growing in size and strength, enable it to stand upright, and now, in this evolved form, it lumbers through Shinagawa. As the self-defense force prepares to engage, the Prime Minister intervenes, prohibiting the attack due to the presence of civilians in the area. Undeterred by the nearby forces, its dorsal spines begin to glow red and it causes significant destruction, before vanishing into the sea. In the aftermath, the government is left to grapple with the implications of this extraordinary event. Special committees are formed, including a group of unconventional experts that are tasked with researching the monster, using the limited information available. 
At the same time, an international discussion begins primarily with the United States. Adding complexity to the situation, the US sends Special Envoy Kyoko Ann Patterson, who reveals that Goro Maki, a disgraced zoology professor, had been studying mutations caused by radioactive contamination. Maki had actually predicted the emergence of such a creature, but his findings were suppressed by the US, and the yacht found in Tokyo Bay, which had belonged to Maki, contained his notes, which indicate the creature originated from an ancient prehistoric marine animal that mutated due to exposure to nuclear waste. Evidence also proposed the creature had adapted to not only withstand, but also consume radioactive waste, as indicated by partially eaten barrels of radioactive material found at the bottom of the ocean, consumed by the creature in its earlier form. What I found interesting to note is that Shin Godzilla presents a stark departure from previous versions, characterized by an emotional detachment throughout the film. Seemingly indifferent to the world around him, Godzilla methodically trudges through populated areas, largely ignoring the efforts of the self-defense forces to destroy him, beyond evolving to survive their attacks. Its bewildering size and rapid mutations lead to the hypothesis that it must require immense energy for movement and metabolic functions. This speculation is confirmed when radiation traces, aligning with the creature's path, confirm nuclear fission as its energy source. The fission process, generating substantial heat, is explained to be regulated by the creature's dorsal spines. With this, experts begin to infer that its retreat to the sea was a necessity. The rapid mutations were energy intensive, producing excessive heat that the creature's body could not dissipate on land. Therefore, the ocean effectively worked as a cooling mechanism to prevent overheating. Further revelations about the creature's biology explain that its genome contained eight times the amount of DNA found in humans. This extraordinary genetic complexity provides insight into its capacity for spontaneous rapid mutation. Re-emerging south of Kamakura and Sagami Bay, the creature, now known as Godzilla, which in Maki's native Odu Island dialect means incarnation of God, makes a formidable reappearance. Having undergone further mutations, it's now significantly larger than before, with a bulkier physique, an elongated tail and dark, almost black skin that periodically glows red with energy. Godzilla's body has effectively become fully adapted to land environments, and he completes the development of his internal nuclear energy cooling system. The advancement meant it no longer needed the ocean to regulate body temperature. His appearance, while reminiscent of previous incarnations, took on a more grotesque and skeletal form, akin to an undead being. His hide was notably riddled with gaps, exposing muscles in several areas, and the ribcage was pronounced, protruding significantly and culminating in a sharply pointed sternum. This iteration also featured a longer neck, with a mouth filled with uneven rows of jagged, shark-like teeth, and a noticeable nose with large, round nostrils. The scales became red, resembling keloid scars, evoking the imagery of atomic bomb victims, and they merged into the structures of his black dorsal plates, reminiscent of blood vessels. Godzilla's arms, more developed but still emaciated and short relative to other versions, contributed to his ghastly appearance. Notably, its tail was longer than his body, with the tip appearing red and bloody, adorned with twisted, mangled bones. There was also a small skull with a prominent jaw at the very end of the tail capable of opening, enabling Godzilla to fire a second devastating atomic beam from the tail. Despite these dramatic changes, Godzilla retained some of his classic traits, he continued to stand in a digitigrade style posture, even with the significant development of his legs, while his eyes, now smaller and lacking eyelids, were protected by a membrane that shielded them from the intense light of his atomic breath. What was most horrifying is how Shin Godzilla's skull unhinged upward when releasing his atomic breath, with the bones of his lower jaw splitting apart, expanding the mouth cavity to accommodate the powerful atomic beam. As Godzilla slowly advanced into Tokyo, its huge size and movement wreaked unprecedented havoc, demolishing the city along its path. Faced with this escalating crisis, the government scrambles to devise another strategy to neutralize this colossal threat. In response, the self-defense force is re-engaged, and the Prime Minister, with great reluctance, authorizes the use of full military force against Godzilla. <laughs> Despite this intense offensive, Godzilla remains remarkably unscathed, devastating a substantial portion of Japan's ground forces in its wake. And as the monster continues its destructive path towards the Minato ward, the US government intervenes, deploying a bombing raid targeted at Godzilla's back, which causes significant blood loss and visibly injures the creature, provoking its fury. Rapidly recovering from the assault, in a terrifying display, its spines begin to glow. 
casting an eerie illumination over the city, before emitting black-purple fumes engulfing the surrounding cityscape. Then, in a sudden explosive act, it ignites the fumes with a fiery breath, instantly lighting up a vast portion of the skyline and unleashing a devastating wave of destruction. This initial fiery blast transitions into a concentrated, high-pitched purple beam that Godzilla directs skyward, successfully targeting and destroying the B-2 bombers responsible for the earlier attack, leaving everyone in shock at the sheer power of the creature. Tragically, this deadly assault also strikes the helicopter carrying the Prime Minister and other key government officials, leading to the formation of a new interim government. With the military forces of both nations decimated, the city engulfed in flames, the government in disarray and numerous casualties, Godzilla gradually halts the attack. Visibly exhausted from the battle, it then enters a state of dormancy to recuperate energy. The catastrophic event amplifies the urgency to unravel Godzilla's mysteries and find a way to stop it. Adding to the problem is the revelation that areas of the city struck by Godzilla's beams are now riddled with dangerously high levels of nuclear radiation, while a radiation plume from its breath and fire begins to drift out to sea. In the midst of this, Yaguchi's research team makes several critical discoveries. First, they find out that Godzilla's fins and blood act as a cooling system. This leads to a theory. By using a coagulating agent, they could potentially induce a reaction that would freeze Godzilla. Further analysis of Godzilla's tissue samples revealed two horrifying capabilities. Godzilla can survive indefinitely, as long as it has access to water and air, which it uses to synthesize the radioactive isotope that powers it, and it has the ability to reproduce asexually. The regenerative capacity is so potent that any severed pieces of Godzilla could technically grow into new entities, posing an even greater threat. Close examination reveals that Godzilla is not only replenishing its energy, a task that's estimated to take a few weeks, but that it also possessed a complex radar-like system within its body, which enabled the accurate destruction of bombers and drones that approached it, even in its dormant state. What's even more terrifying is that Godzilla possessed such an extraordinarily complex genome that the creature could potentially evolve further. A scientist even ventures that given the right conditions and motivations, Godzilla might develop wings. And that would mark the end of the human race. Meanwhile, the United Nations, led by the US and unaware of Godzilla's newfound vulnerabilities, declare the use of thermonuclear weapons against Godzilla as an inevitable course of action, leading to a two-week countdown, within which Japan is forced to evacuate the city. But determined to prevent another nuclear detonation on Japanese soil, Patterson decides to leverage her political influence, aiming to buy Yaguchi's team the time they needed to execute their plan, fully aware that this could jeopardize her political career. It's here the Japanese team devised the Yashiori strategy, which involves the creation of a blood coagulant to drastically lower Godzilla's internal temperature, effectively freezing the monster. As the plan is set into motion, driverless trains loaded with bombs are sent to collide with Godzilla's legs, waking the creature. Following this, American drones drop additional bombs. As expected, in response, the monster defensively emits beams from its mouth and dorsal spikes. Recognizing the high energy cost of these abilities, Godzilla even adapts by developing the atomic tail beam, serving as a more energy efficient alternative. And just as planned, this counterattack rapidly depletes Godzilla's energy reserves, leaving it vulnerable as it approached the line of skyscrapers. In a coordinated effort, the Japanese forces cause multiple skyscrapers to collapse onto it, immobilizing the monster and enabling a team of pump trucks to quickly move in to administer the coagulant into Godzilla's mouth. However, the first attempt fails as Godzilla swiftly recovers and annihilates the vehicles. Undeterred by the initial setback, they deploy a second, larger contingent of driverless trains in a massive assault. The sheer force of the resulting detonations topples the monster, causing it to fall forward and sprawl across a large building. This moment of vulnerability allows the second group to successfully execute their mission, injecting the full dose of the coagulant into Godzilla's open mouth. Despite this, Godzilla demonstrates a remarkable resilience, quickly recovering and standing up once again before proceeding to obliterate the second group of pump trucks. However, as it begins to move forward, Godzilla emits a thunderous roar before beginning to freeze completely in its tracks above Tokyo Station. In the aftermath, it's revealed that the American government has temporarily paused but not cancelled their countdown to a nuclear strike on Tokyo. The decision basically hinged on whether Godzilla reawakened. As a result, the Japanese people are left with the daunting task of rebuilding their nation in the shadow of emotionless Godzilla. The film then concludes with a distressing and unsettling image. The camera pans to a frozen Godzilla, focusing particularly on the split end of its tail. Here a chilling sight unfolds, 
multiple skeletal humanoid figures are seen emerging from the tail's split tip. Each figure, frozen in what appears to be an attempt to escape, bears Godzilla-like dorsal plates, hinting at the creature's ominous and unfathomable biological and mutative evolutionary capabilities. The third reboot of Japan's iconic and highly successful Godzilla franchise was poised to be a monumental achievement. With a substantial budget of 15 million US dollars, the project was entrusted to Hideaki Anno, the renowned director of Evangelion, and Shinji Higuchi, known for directing Sinking in Japan and serving as a special effects director of Gamera. Higuchi's reputation as one of Japan's top special effects supervisors further underscored Toho's commitment to leaving nothing to chance. The investment paid off handsomely as Shin Godzilla emerged as the highest grossing live action Japanese film of 2016 and the most successful Japanese produced Godzilla film upon its release. Its critical acclaim was equally impressive, securing 11 nominations at the Japan Academy Prize and winning seven, including the prestigious Picture and Director of the Year. Drawing thematic inspiration from Ishiro Honda's original 1954 Godzilla, which was deeply rooted in the anxieties of the Second World War and the Atomic Age, Shin Godzilla resonates with contemporary concerns. The film reflects on the Fukushima nuclear disaster and the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. This connection is visually represented by government officials donning blue jumpsuits, reminiscent of those worn by Yukio Adano, Japan's chief government spokesman during the earthquake tsunami crisis. It also scrutinizes the workings of the government and the overall efficacy of the state apparatus from the highest levels down. Additionally, the film casts a very critical eye on the role of the US government in international affairs, particularly those involving Japan. The co-directors don't stop there. They also reflect on the Japanese Imperial Army, critique the shortcomings of intellectuals, particularly noted figures, and their hesitance to act quickly due to concerns about their reputation. <laughs> Reflecting Adana's commitment, the film's characters work tirelessly, often sacrificing sleep, food, and personal hygiene in their relentless response effort. The co-directors bring a dynamic approach to the film, employing a semi-documentary style that, at times, echoes found footage. The narrative unfolds in near real time, with briefings that allow audiences to stay in touch of the developing situation. Complementing the visual storytelling is Shiro Sugusu's remarkable score, which masterfully remixes his compositions for Neon Genesis Evangelion and Akira Ufukube's classic Godzilla scores, adding to the film's chaotic and immersive atmosphere. The film is characterized by its rapid pace and crisp editing, with frequent changes in setting and a presentation style reminiscent of a TV news broadcast. The directors cleverly build tension by focusing on the aftermath and the consequences before Godzilla's reappearance, which effectively heightens the suspense. Additionally, Godzilla's transformations maintain the sense of foreboding until the creature is finally revealed in its full glory, might, and evolutionary horror. The acting aligns seamlessly with this approach, with the cast delivering lines in a quick, succinct manner that reflects the brisk scene transitions. This technique is complemented by the editing work of Atsuki Sato and Anno. While Hiroki Hasegawa plays the protagonist, the movie doesn't focus excessively on any single character. Instead, they aim to include as many faces as possible, a strategy that is well served by the film's overall approach to showing how unity can overcome the might of gods. The special effects team excel in both the design and animation of Godzilla, bringing the monster to life in an impressive manner. And the scenes of destruction are more spectacular than ever, highlighting the futile efforts of the army to halt the unstoppable monster. This combination of visual mastery and storytelling makes Shin Godzilla a standout addition to the Godzilla franchise. It's not just an impressive monster movie, it delves deeper, offering substantial socio-political commentary. The film juxtaposes the value of thought and science against the destructiveness of violence and war, essentially comparing the roles of scientists and the military. It touches upon the pitfalls of nuclear energy and the complexities of human nature. The insights are delivered often through just a line or two, requiring the viewer's full attention to grasp and appreciate their significance. Shin Godzilla stands out as not only a great mainstream film, but also one of the most meaningful, visually stunning, and well-directed entries in the series. And after 31 films in 63 years, the iconic monster is back as an evolutionary menace the likes of which has not been seen before. With that said, that's all for today, folks. A huge thanks to everyone that requested we explore Shin Godzilla. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the movie, so please share that in the comments below. 
Also, I thought I'd give you guys a heads up and mention that we're going to be covering Godzilla Minus One next week, so stay tuned for that. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and if there's anything else you'd like for me to cover, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.